talking about a topic, spreading salt. Spreading salt. Last week I gave you an assignment if you were here, and that was to read Matthew chapter 5. I'm not going to ask how many read it. <laughs> but I will ask you, uh, if you have read it, read it again. And if you haven't already done so, read it. Read chapter 5, Matthew. As a matter of fact, if you feel... Um, if you feel so inclined to do so, read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Uh, how, many, how many enjoy a good message? Enjoy a good message. Jesus preached a message in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. Wouldn't you love to hear Jesus preach? Read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Jesus preached a sermon. And we have it today. So my, my, uh, my assignment this week again is read Matthew chapter 5. You may say, now, Pastor, wait a minute. You gave us that assignment last week. Read it, church. Read this book, and then read it again, and then read it again, and then read it again. The psalmist said, thy word have I hid in my heart. Why? Why? Does anybody know? Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Does anybody know how tough it is to sin against God when you're reading the word? Because God gets your attention. So you have a double blessing when you read the word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Let it become a part of you. Read God's word. So the assignment for this week again is read Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to give you a sneak, a little bit of a preview. Just a few verses from Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> verses 1 through 13. The, the scripture records, seeing the crowds, he, referring to Jesus, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, now this is Jesus preaching to them, and he speaks to us today. Verse 2, he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Here's what Jesus says to do. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven, so, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And here is our key verse for today. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Look at your neighbor and say, spreading salt. Spreading salt. Well, while I was preparing this message, I came across something in my notes. I take notes all the time. I have thousands of notes. When, when I, I see something and I thought, I think I may be able to use this sometime. You know, it, it, it speaks to some truth. And so I just, I just saved that note. I have thousands of those notes. And so when I'm preparing a message, you know, I'll look through all those notes and and so when I was preparing this message <clears throat> about spreading salt, I came across something in my notes from last October. That's when I found it, it was last October. And the writer's name was Jim Mitchell. And Jim Mitchell shared part of a Facebook post from August 2016. So it goes back a little ways. And I'll tell you what, church, this would be a good time for somebody to say, God help our pastor. You're going to find out why in just a minute. Because the story that Jim Mitchell showed was called, No, No, Bad Roomba. No, No, Bad Roomba. Now, how many know what a Roomba is? Anybody know what a Roomba is? Okay, I'm going to educate you. It's a little, round, automated machine, and it automatically vacuums your floor. Carpets, floors, little round thing. You know, and when, when the battery runs low, you know what, you know what R2D2, I mean Roomba does? Roomba goes, Roomba goes back to the charger and he and he gets charged up and then, then he just keeps on going. And he goes of all hours. Of course, you can program only to do it at a certain time. So what some people do is they program it just to do it when they're asleep. So they don't trip on it or whatever. And it's pretty silent. 
just does its thing. You don't even hardly hear it. Now, doesn't that sound like a good idea? A smart invention? Oh, bad, bad rumor. Well, Jim Mitchell shared this story. He says, a few years ago, some neighbors of ours became internet famous with their hilarious family story, now known as the uh, Pooh Pop Clips. Went viral. <clears throat> Tell me I have another image, please. We're not going to leave this one up here very long. Well, I like doing my research. So I did my research. I thought, where did Jim Mitchell get this story? So I found this post from August 9th, 2016. It was very popular. I looked it up, found it. And over 190,000, 193,000 reacted to this story. Put a little emoji, like a smiley face or something that said they liked it or they laughed about it or just wow when they read the story. It has been shared over 365,000 times. And what's interesting is when I was preparing this message, I found, I was able to dig and find that original post. It, it showed, you know, how many people liked it and shared it. One of the people that liked it was my sister. So, Carol, if you're listening, uh, you like that story. So, uh, I don't want you to get that image in your mind, but I wanted to leave it up. Sorry, Tony, I wanted to leave it up for just a little bit. Uh, Tony, we'll get off that image. Once I explain it, the image will come a little clearer to you, I think. Well, the way this guy discovered the problem is uh, it was like 3 o'clock in the morning or whatever, and he woke up and their little toddler climbed in bed with them. You know how that is with grandchildren, right? Sometimes they like to just climb in bed with you. Margaret, that little, that little baby, I call him baby, he's probably two or three years old. That little baby climbed in bed, and, and Kelly, that, that father smelled something on that baby. I told you, I told you better pray for me faster. Smell something a little poopy. So he decided he'd get up, clean that baby up. And Bill, as he was walking, he noticed the floor felt a little gritty. So he cleans the baby up and he figures he'd better investigate. Well, what happened was they had a young puppy. And during the night, sometime wee hours in the morning, that puppy had left a little present. How do I say this in church? A little pile of present. Do I need to be any more <laughs> descriptive? Thank you. He left a little pile of a present. And they had this room of program, Karen, so he would wake up, you know, certain times. It wouldn't bother them. So about, I think it was about 1, 1 30, 2 30, something anyway. Sometime in the middle of the morning, it's pre-scheduled vacuuming. The bad, bad room. We can go back to bad, bad room. I think that's the next one, Tony. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that bad, bad rumor woke up and he went on his rounds. You know, they bump against the wall, they just go another. They don't go on it. It's not an even pattern, they just go zigzag, but they'll cover every square inch. So on Roomba's rounds, Roomba ran over the pile of poop on the rug. And he spent the next few hours meticulously massaging it into every crease and fiber of the wood floor and Bad, bad room. Some of you are going to check it out when you get home. It's a long story of everything he did to try to get it cleaned up. Hmm. He said it was everywhere. Everywhere. So imagine that. Imagine that what should have been a confined mess and an easy spot to clean the next morning had now turned into this, this nightmare of streaks all across the entire home. You know, it's mind-boggling how a small mess can reach when it's spread thin enough. Something was spread everywhere. That's mind-boggling, isn't it? How a little, little mess, little, just a little problem, just a little mess, when you start to spread it out, it's a big mess. Oh, Lord, help your pastor. I remember years ago, Ray, somebody told me that uh, uh, be careful what you throw around because when stuff hits the fan, it goes everywhere. Okay? It's mind-boggling, but it's not all that uncommon. In fact, Jim Mitchell said in his article, I've seen it in my own life many times, not on the floor of my home, but in my, in my heart, in the corners of my heart. 
It seems to start innocently somewhere along the course of the day. A, a thought will form based on interaction with my wife. Nothing earth shattering or heavy. Maybe just a hunch from something she said or, or didn't say. Or, or maybe my wife said it imperfectly. Or, or maybe, Sister Glenn, are you listen? Or maybe she didn't say it at all. But I just thought she said it. Or it was just an impression by some nonverbal signal that just struck me the wrong way. It's normal and typical stuff. Until, of course, the Roomba in my mind wakes up and starts spinning around into suspicion. Turns that hunch into an assumption. Turns that thought to a lasting grudge. And before I really know it, what could have been a confined mess and an easy spot to clean up has become an unappealing smear on our relationship. No, no. Bad rumor. So church, I have a question for you this morning. What are you spreading around? Why did the Lord lay this on my heart? Perhaps it's because I see a lot of stuff being spread around. I know plain talk is easily understood. But church, I see a lot of stuff being spread around. And spread around. And spread around. And it makes a stink. And it makes a mess. What are you spreading around? Last week I shared with you the truth from God's word. That we are to love our enemies. So what are you spreading around? Well, we should be spreading love and not hate. There's a lot of hate being spread around. We are children of God. So we just sang about Jesus loves me. He's a good, good father. That's who he is. I'm loved by him. There's no greater love than what God has. And I come to him just as I am, just broken and wounded. He fixes me up. We sing and praise God for all that. And that's the God that lives in us. So what we ought to be doing is spreading love. We should be spreading love and not hate. Kerry Newhoff has a book called Didn't See It Coming. And he says the thrust of the gospel, the good news, is that Jesus sees your hate and meets it with love. You hear that this morning? That's what Jesus did. He saw hate and he met it with love. Guess what we should do, church? We see the hate. We meet it with love. I promise you, people aren't expecting that. They're throwing hate around and they're expecting hate to come back. Oh, God help your pastor. hang around mess too long, you start to smell like mess. If you step in mess, you smell like mess. People spread the hate around, they, be, they, they start being, they, you can just, you're around them, they're just hateful. Everything is anger and everything is hate. My prayer is for believers in Jesus Christ that we wake up to the message in God's word that says we should be spreading love and not hate. Because what God does he, is he sees your despair and he counters it with hope. He sees your doubt and he throws belief back at you again and again. And cynicism, there's a lot of people that are cynical about what's going on in this world. It melts under the relent, relentless hope of the gospel. What else should we be spreading? We should be spreading God's word. It's more important than what we think. There's a lot of people who think I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say what I gotta say or it's gonna kill me. No, it's not. Sometimes we need to keep our mouth shut. And how about if we have something to say? Why don't we talk about what God's word has to say? We should be spreading God's word. It's more important than what we think or what I think. Craig Rochelle in his book, Tony did a study on this, oh, it's been some time ago on Wednesday night. His book, Craig Rochelle's book, was called Hashtag Struggles Following Jesus in a Selfie-Centered World. Craig Rochelle says, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. Now, we live in an age where anybody can set up a free account and say anything they want. And there's a lot of stuff being said that doesn't need to be said. In fact, I see people sharing things. They see an article and they share it. 
which means they kind of support it. And then somebody will say, well, you know that article's fake. And they say, well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, it matters. The truth matters, church. The truth matters, and this is where we find the truth. Craig Rochelle also says in that same book, when people say you love God above all, or would they think you love something else more, maybe even yourself? He explains it this way. He said, I encourage you to go through everything you've posted or said online in the, last, in the past month. Pretend like you don't know anything about yourself. Look at everything objectively and determine what conclusion someone would draw about you based on what you posted. Do you like what you see? What does your online footprint reveal about you? Does what you show accurately reflect what you believe? When people say you love God above all, or would they think you love something else more, maybe even yourself? Now, maybe you're sitting here this morning, you're saying, well, I'm not an online kind of person. I don't go online. I don't do that Facebook stuff. Okay. Well, let me modify Craig's words a little bit. I encourage you to go through everything you've said to anyone this past month. Pretend like you don't know what you think about yourself. Look at everything you've said objectively and determine what conclusion someone would draw about you based on what you've said. Do you like what you see? What does what you say reveal about you? Does what you say accurately reflect what you believe? Would people say you love God above all? Or would they think you love something else more? Maybe even yourself. Now here's the reminder. We should be spreading God's word. It's more important than what we think. So think about the things we write or the things that we say. And I got a news flash for you. I'm going to stand upon the authority of God's word and I'm going to tell you where your words, whether you write them or say them, I'm going to tell you where they come from. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever's in your heart, that's where it comes from. People say, well, I know they said that, but that's really not the kind of person they are, to which I say, oh, yes, they are. Saying it didn't make them that kind of person. People that say hateful people aren't hateful because they say hateful things. It's not the way it works. You know why they say hateful things? Because they're hateful in their heart. People that say angry things don't become angry because they just said something out of anger. It's because of the anger in their heart. It works the other way, too. People that say loving and kind things are not loving and kind because they just said something loving and kind. That's not the way it works. They have love in their heart. They have kindness in their heart. They have mercy in their heart. They have forgiveness in their heart. And that comes out in the way we speak. So, if what we say doesn't reflect what we think is in our heart, we don't have a speech problem. Guess what we have? Thank you. We have a heart problem. And who is the one who can heal the heart and change the heart? No, wait a minute, I know. It's Republicans. No, it's Democrats. No, it's Independents. It's who's in the White House. It's who's going to be in the White House next. It's who was in the White House. Nope. What's his name? Jesus. Jesus. Oh, no, no, it's Grandma. It's Grandpa. Nope. Oh, I know who it is. It's me. Look at me. I'm going to change my own heart. Wrong. Jesus is the only one who can change a heart. We should be spreading God's word. It's more important than what we think. So that's why uh, this message today, and that is we should be spreading salt. Go back to Matthew 5, 13. That's our key verse. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything, except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Now I want you to notice something. What Jesus says and what he does not say. He does not say you all can be the salt of the earth. That's not what he says. Nor does he say you all should be the salt of the earth. What does he say? You are the salt of the earth. In the Greek, it's literally you and you alone. I mean, he's being specific. He's talking to you. He's speaking to your heart and to my heart. So here's something I want you to know. Christians like salt can, can lose their usefulness. Christians like salt can lose their usefulness. Jesus says that if the salt loses its, its flavor or its taste, it's no longer good for anything just to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Now, technically speaking, 
Salt cannot lose its saltiness. Sodium chloride is a stable compound. But in the part of the world where Jesus lived, Tony, I think I have a picture of the Dead Sea. Salt was collected from around the Dead Sea where the crystals were often contaminated with other mi minerals. So these crystallized formations were full of impurities. And since the actual salt was more soluble than the impurities, the rain could wash out the salt, which made what was left of it little, of little worth. It had lost its saltiness. The salt, most of the salt would come out and what was left was worthless. So when this happened, that was thrown out. It was no longer of any value, either to preserve anything or to flavor anything. When that salt was leached out, it still looked like salt, but it lost its taste. And the peculiar property of salt is that even though it may have lost its, its, its taste, it still retained one devastating potency. It could still destroy plant life. You wouldn't want to eat it. It lost its taste, but it could still destroy things. Oh, God help us. The same principle applies in the lives of Christians. Either our lives are counting for good and for God, or they are making an impact for evil and the enemy. The way we live, the things we say, the attitudes we entertain, the lifestyle we adopt are continuously producing either positive or negative reacts in society. Our lives, whether we are aware of it or not, either count for God or against Him. There's no middle ground. So if we're not careful, we can lose our taste. We can lose our, our usefulness. Also, Christians like salt are to promote thirst. You know what happens when you have salt? You get thirsty. That's why they like to sell salty things in ball games. <laughs> they know they'll get you thirsty. Here, have this popcorn, have this peanuts. You say, yeah, I don't want the drink, it's too expensive. You're coming back. You're coming back. Salt makes you thirsty. Christians are to make Christ attractive and desirable. Whenever we as Christians are introduced into a setting, whether it's social or work related, the unbelievers should see evidence of the difference that Jesus Christ makes in our life. Let me put it this way. Others should be able to look at us and say, I don't know what they have, but I want it. If we're not living that kind of life where people recognize it, or maybe people who come up and say, how do you do this? You know, all this stuff going on, how do you, how do you have peace? I've had people come to me before and say, why, why are you not getting angry? You know, why, why, aren't you get, why aren't you getting upset about this? I say, Jesus, I've got, I've got peace about me. I've got peace, and that peace comes. For Jesus, people ought to be able to look at us and say, I want what they have. I want what they have. We're to promote thirst. When we're around people, when, when what we say and what we do and how we act is around other people, people should say, I want to act that way. Now, it's a challenge for us, church. People come among us, they ought to say, I want to act like these people act. Sister Annie, that's what won me to Jesus. I didn't believe in God. I came to a small little church, and you know what I saw, Richard? These people loved each other. I said, oh, that's pretty cool. And guess what, David? Then they loved me. Some little punk kid. Some troublemaker. Somebody who's doing all kinds of things wrong, getting into all kinds of uh, tr trouble. But, but they love me. And I'm like, they don't love me because of me. If they, if, they, if they knew me, they wouldn't love me. When they got to know me, guess what, Betty? They still love me. And all of a sudden I began to think, there's, there's something going on here. And, and then I began to think, I want that. I want that. I want that. So Christians like salt are to promote thirst. And also Christians like salt must have contact to have an influence. How many of you here have a salt shaker? Jimmy have a salt shaker. So if you're going to have something at your house that needs a little salt, it probably works like this. You go grab your salt shaker. You leave, you leave your food on the table. You go grab your salt shaker, you just shake it a little bit, and you walk back and your food is all salty. Is that the way it works? No. No. The salt has to have contact. Has to have contact, to have an influence. Salt was used and can be used to preserve meat. But salt doesn't do any good just sitting on a shelf someplace and the meat somewhere else. To be effective in those days to preserve the meat, the salt had to be rubbed into it. 
In a similar way, Christians are to allow God to use us wherever he has placed us. Wherever the church has become a salt warehouse, we've missed out on the lesson that salt must have a contact and have an effect. Churches aren't supposed to be salt warehouses. We're supposed to be a place where we come as salt shakers and be motivated and say, I want to I touch somebody's life. Rub a little salt on you. Oh, God help us. And lastly, Christians like salt should have a distinctive flavor. You ever put on too much salt? And you say, ruh -ruh. I remember I use, uh, what's that yellow stuff called? Glenda? Splenda. I use Splenda sometimes. And you know, I shake that little packet. And I used to be careless. Valerie, I would just tear that thing. And then I'd reach over my food and pour it in my unsweet tea. I don't do that anymore. Now I tear it and I very carefully make sure it's over my glass before I shake it into the tea. You know why? Because one time I was at a restaurant and I tore that little packet and on my way over to my drink, poured all over my food. Splenda and country style steady. <laughs> they don't go too good together. Just like salt. You can have too much salt. Glenda does it very quickly. I'm always adding a little bit a little bit more, just a little bit more salt. Now, I know I can have too much salt. I like salt. I like salty things. When I was a little boy, I used to get Lay's potato chips. Yes, they were around when I was a youngster. And James, you know what I'd do? I'd always have a salt shaker when I ate Lay's potato chips. Now, isn't that ignorant? But I like salt. I just like salt. But the truth is, it only takes a little salt, doesn't it, Mark? Mark, you cook. It only takes a little, a little salt. You put too much salt in. That's why the salt shaker has little holes on it. If you just open the top, you'd have a mess. Salt has a distinctive flavor. Every time you use salt, you know exactly what to expect. You know why? Because it has a consistent flavor. You know what salt tastes like? Somebody tell me. Thank you. It always tastes like salt. It does not conform to the taste of something else. Salt doesn't taste like popcorn. When you put salt on popcorn, the salt doesn't taste like popcorn. The popcorn tastes salty. That's the way it works. It gives its flavor to whatever you put it on. Stay with me. That's what salt does. You put a little salt on something, it begins to flavor wherever it is. Christians should be like that. We should have a distinctive flavor. The church has a clear and distinctive message for the world. And this flavor requires contact. And you know what? Here's another thing. The longer you leave the salt in, the deeper it penetrates. There's places in this world that need a little salt from Christians. Need a little salt. Need a little bit of Christians in there. It, it penetrates. The more, the more you put it on there, rub it in deep, begins to, begins to uh, flavor it. Think about it. If you leave sugar in a salt shaker, then the sugar doesn't turn to, to salt. That's not how that works. They still have their still have sugar and salt. But what that salt will do is start to flavor it. Here's the problem, church. Too many Christians are contented just to stay in this big shaker. Say, well, the church building is our salt shaker. But Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. Not the church building. Not the church collectively. He's talking to us today. Because you can leave salt in a shaker for 50 years and it's not going to do anybody any good. Oh boy. I told you to pray for me, so I hope you have been. You can sit in a pew for 50 years. Then you have to ask yourself, what have I flavored? Now, I'm not saying everyone has to have some kind of personal mission to go overseas or even go to a local mission. We have a personal mission everywhere we go. Crystal, when people go to Walmart, I'm a Christian and I go to Walmart, how to be kind to those Walmart workers, shouldn't I? Crystal's probably, she works at Walmart. She's probably seen people be ugly to Walmart workers. They're there. You know what I say? Thank you for working. I appreciate your work and I appreciate what you do. You'd be surprised when you're kind to people how that flavors flavors the situation. So everywhere you go, your workplace, your, your places that you, you go and shop, 
Uh, Jenny said earlier, you know, part of the problem is a lot of us have been stuck at home, and after a while, <laughs> that stress begins to build up. Guess what you should do if you're stuck at home? You should still be kind. You should still flavor that situation. Spreading salt. That's the message today. Somebody asked me before church, what's the message going to be about? <laughs> I can sum it up this way. We're all spreading something. So I'll close this way. You want to make an impact for Jesus Christ? Or you want to be the bad dad we're black? We you stand? We want to make an impact for Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? If you bow your heads, Jesus, thank you for the word. There's power in the word. There's truth in the word. Oh God, I just pray now that you would make your word come alive in us. As we've heard the word of God, it says that we should be uh, flavoring this world. Lord, we, right now we're preserving this world. If we're not careful, Lord, then we'll, we'll destroy things around us. We don't want to destroy things. There's a lot of destruction, division, hate going on in this world. We want to be those that spread good things, that spread kindness and love and mercy and forgiveness. We want to spread you, Jesus. Help us, Lord, as we leave this place to be determined, Lord, that we're going to have contact. Lord, it may not even be physical contact because of what we're going through, but it can be emotional contact. Lord, here's my prayer. Lay somebody on each of our hearts. Lord, just, just let that name rest in our spirit. And Lord, I pray that you would just compel us to reach out to that person this week. Someone who needs to hear this message. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Help us to do that. To spread that little bit of salt. That just that tiny bit, Lord, will make an impact. Help us do these things, Jesus. Because it will glorify you. And as you do this, we'll say thank you. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming to the house of the Lord. You'll be blessed in Jesus' name.